Okay, so I can't really do this with good lighting because of, um, what we got for my dash light. Let me try just this a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, so I just got out of C, the, so this is count zero. I just got out of seeing, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey in 70 millimeter. I apologize once again for the poor lighting because I'm using my car as dash light. I'm trying to do the, uh, Brad Jones thing, and for example, tried doing it in the middle of the night, and it doesn't work that hot. Apologize for that. We'll give this a shot anyway. This is my first time seeing 2001: A Space Odyssey in 70 millimeter. I've seen the film before, um, but mainly on DVD, on Blu-ray, on television, and that sort of thing. And <sighs> silly, be silly with the lighting. And I apologize for this basically being the Todd in the Shadows <laughs> style of review, but no, or, or deep for. Deep Throat's the wrong phrasing, but in, anyway. First time seeing uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey in 70mm. It is a really fun, interesting film. I Well, fun in the sense of there's a lot to dig into. It's There's lots of detailed little things to see um, when, you've, when you've watched this a bunch of times, which I have. I'm not going to do a big blow-by-blow -blow plot synopsis thing. I'm not going to do a big in-depth analysis thing for this kind of critique because partially because I've got to deal with battery and that sort of thing. Also because, well, 2001 The Space Odyssey one of those films that people have written essays about, like big, long, elaborate film essays. And like for like, or for that matter, like books, just books about so I don't think I can encapsulate that in this fit in this video. Instead, I'm gonna talk about more about the experience about seeing the film in 70 millimeter. There's a lot of having seen this movie a bunch of times again on TV, there's a lot of details that I as a viewer have missed when I was watching the film previously that I'm seeing here now because there it's in the big screen, everything's bigger. And thus things which are very small and hard to catch on a television screen, on a smaller screen, are writ much larger and easier to notice. As give a couple examples, there's a bit in the film where um this like early on when Haywood Floyd goes to the Clavius space to give his brief to do um receive the briefing and see uh, the, the Tycho model for himself. And before he, when he goes up to give his explanation, he walks by this one scientist and gives him a quick grab on the shoulder, um, either as hello or reassurance or that sort of thing. And it's, it's a little note, little character note. We have no dialogue between these two characters, I think, for the rest of the film. But it's just a little bit of like, hey, Floyd knows these guys. He... he is familiar with these guys, it gives a sense, gives more of a sense of sincerity to the words he's about to say when he gives his big spiel and about him not liking the cover story and that sort of thing than if he didn't do that thing. It it's builds, emp shows there's a sense of empathy and sim an actual sincere empathy and sympathy between uh, Floyd and the researchers other little bits, some of it's like that come up off and on throughout the film. Uh, way sh shots are framed with particular things in foreground or background. Uh, like before Hal kills the scientist in cryostasis, spoilers for a freaking 50 year old movie. Um, when Hal kills the scientists in cryosleep, he, we, the, before we get that shot, we have a, where that starts, we have a shot from Hal's point of view of the chairs that we normally see Dave and, uh, Frank sitting in, Dave Bowman and Frank Poole, when they're talking to Hal. They're now vacant because Frank has been killed and Dave is outside of the ship, leaving, giving Hal with the complete total run of the place, allowing him to get away with, with his murder. His murders. Additionally, when you're seeing the movie on the big screen, at the big screen sound system, there are sound effects in the film that I've overlooked completely before that are significant here. There's this sort of 
res resonating hum that comes up when connection with the monolith, particularly whenever anyone is about to touch it. Or when anyone does touch it, like when Haywood Floyd touches the monolith uh, in the uh, Tycho Crater. And it also came up earlier in the film with the, uh, the Dawn of Man sequence. And when we get the piercing shriek when the monolith sends a signal out to Jupiter, it has a lot more weight and power to it. I remember when I was in the theater, I was seeing lots of people actually grabbing their ears, like the scientists and people in the film were, and similar sorts of things. With And this also ups the impact of when the scientists in cryostasis are killed. In the film, it's done, there's no score, the only sound effects going with it are the emergency alarms for the fact that there, that the life signs readings are progressively flatlining. And on television, on DVD, on Blu-ray, unless you have a really good sound system, this understates the, 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 the murder that is being committed by Hal. It underplays it. Not it seems on deliberately to how this these crime the, the, these killings are being done by Hal in what is effectively in not quite silence but in a quiet subdued manner. It's a horrible act being done coldly and dispassionately on the big screen with a the theatrical sound system. The tones of these alarms are much sharper and much harsher. And so the, and so instead the auditory violence of these emergency alarms for all the thing flatlining make for a much more significant, uh, for lack of a better term, proxy for physical violence. Because there is no physical violence, they're in cryo sleep, that sort of thing. So, that really emphasizes the auditory experience. Additionally, seeing this at 70 millimeter gets the scale across better. There are lots of little tidbits and things that Kubrick does in the film to give sense of scale for these wide shots. Uh, when we go deck, when the shuttle pod thing, I forget what the name of that particular vehicle is, comes in to the Clavius base and is lowered down to the tune of the Blue Danube, we have these little rear-projected bits from offices and control areas overlooking this central shaft that give the sense of scale to how big this is. And it definitely gives me... A, I've been watching... I, if you follow my blog, you follow my YouTube channel, I watch anime. And recently, I've been watching, um, or the past few months, I wa finished watching Gundam Double Zeta, and I watched Dallos. And this really gives me a kind of cue, seeing this after having, or re-watching 2001, after seeing this other anime, gives me kind of cue of how influential this film has been, not just in terms of direct references to elements of the plot or narrative or that sort of thing, but in terms of visual style and in terms of, like, technical con concepts. Dallos is very much a film which takes 2001 A Space Odyssey and our, and um, Robert Heinlein's The Moon is a Harsh Mistress and mixes them together. It doesn't finish either story, unfortunately, but it mashes those stories together in an interesting manner. As an aside, more Oshi, if you're watching this, I doubt you are, but if you are, Dallos Part 2, please? Second, um, the same sort of thing with, with uh, Gundam and the moon outposts there, which have a similar vast scope to them. The same way that the Clavius base, we don't see the vast scope of the base as a whole, but we it comes across through like bits with the uh, landing shaft and that sort of thing. So, and all this comes across much better in 70 millimeter on a large format screen, a large screen, than on your hover bigger TV is at home. So with that out of the way, do I recommend seeing 2001 A Space Odyssey if you have a chance to see it in 70 millimeter? Absolutely. I'd love to even see it in Cinerama with all three screens, but 
I don't know if I'll ever get a chance to see that. There aren't many really Cinerama theaters still around these days. I'd love to see get the chance to see it that way, but I'll take what I can get. The Hollywood Theater does a screening of 2001 A Space Odyssey in 70mm once a year. I don't know if, I'm not, don't know if I'd go again next year, at least not by myself. I'd probably want to go see it with someone else who hadn't seen it in 70mm before. And that's the big stuff. So have you seen 2001 A Space Odyssey in 70mm? Um, are there any movies that you've seen in 70mm that you think gained a great deal from seeing it in the larger screen on a larger detailed film stock? Um, one other bit with this is I had the good fortune with the screening that the print that they're doing is relatively new. Uh, Paul Allen had commissioned a fresh print of 70 millimeter print of 2001 from the original master. And that print is what was used for this screening, which gives me an opportunity that a lot of people might not have. So that was particularly awesome as well. Anyway, if you have a chance to see the film in 70 millimeter, definitely uh, take advantage of it. If you have had the chance to see 2001 70 millimeter, please give your thoughts in the uh, comments below. Similarly, if there is a film that you have seen in 70 millimeter and that you think really benefits from seeing it in that form, once again, post that as well. I have had the opportunity to see Tron and Ghostbusters in 70 millimeter as well, the original Ghostbusters, both of whom, both of which were particularly good, especially Tron. So, once again, thank you very much for watching. Um, we'll do the usual stinger at the end. Um, See you next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something particularly you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.